Hey guys, welcome back to Scream Queen Stream. Today's an exciting day. Why? Because I want to share with you the Q&A from after the opening night film from Cinequest 2020, John Panette, Go Now. I was so moved and touched by this film, and I wasn't expecting it. Now, granted, you know I'm not the biggest fan of comedies. I do watch them sometimes, but I don't seek them out all the time. However, I have learned from attending Cinequest in years past that if you're not doing anything, go to one of their movies, because regardless of what you know about it, it's sure to be really entertaining. And this was no exception. So I learned so much about John Panette, who is a famous comedian who I did recognize, but I can't tell you that I know his work. I know that he starred in the last episode of Seinfeld, and he's one of those faces that you will definitely recognize. Uh, that being said, I was blown away. It was moving, it was touching, it made me tear up, which I wasn't expecting, and this is the Q&A from that opening night. Note, I was really sad that Cinequest had to be cancelled due to the pandemic, but obviously everyone's safety comes first. I was hopeful for a second uh, edition in the summer, however, due to the pandemic still going on in America, that is not going to be happening. I will link Cinequest down below. They still remain one of my favorite, if not the favorite festival I've ever been a part of. They're simply amazing. Their staff is amazing. The judges are amazing. Everybody involved is spectacular, and I was so honored to be involved. Before I let you guys get to the q and I just want to let you know this is so the synopsis is, remembering influential comedic performer John Panette, more than just the fat guy from the last episode of Seinfeld, and it was directed by Bob Krakauer. So again, I really encourage you that if you can get this film, it was really, really great. Even if you're not a fan of the comedian himself or don't know who he is, as was my case, I really enjoyed seeing it. I'm so glad that I did. So here's a Q&A. Well, I'm watching this tonight, I'm, I'm reminded when I first started working with stand-ups, something that people don't really understand about it. Um, Jim Norton, anybody know Jim Norton? Woo! Yeah, right. Uh, I, I once asked Jimmy how long it took to put together six good minutes. How much, like a dozen people that can do that, and I think it gets taken for granted a lot. Uh, so when he passed, uh, both of us had a similar response immediately to his life being reduced to the fat guy on Seinfeld what is his life and his career uh, was so much more than that. And uh, when we were at the funeral, it just felt like somehow he wasn't being represented very well or very accurately. And the two things combined made us uh, pretty pissed off, actually. And so we decided to do something about it. The only problem was uh, neither one of us had ever directed a documentary or worked on a documentary or anything to do with a documentary. <laughs> uh, but we didn't care. So, you know, also, you know, I don't think it's a secret looking at us that we're not spring chickens, so we weren't really sure how this was going to work. Plus, he has his family I have mine. I live in New York, he lives in LA, he's got his job, I've got mine. We just really like, how are we going to do this? And basically, we just put one foot in front of the other. I think the first interview we did, I can't remember, it was either the end of 2014 or beginning of 2015. That sounded right, is um, And we just, put, we just put one interview at a time, not really knowing where it was leading or where it would go. But we went up to Boston. That was uh, Sonny, his manager, and Dominic, the, uh, and Rogerson, and, and Gavin. And, and when we got there, we felt like maybe we had something. And then we came down in New York. Um, and it was in New York that we thought, yeah, we've, we've really got something. And what was that moment that you, I mean, you, you said the Boston. There was something that you felt might be missing in Boston that you discovered. Uh, we did an interview uh, with a comedian in New York who, it just completely so happened, uh, was in the club for John's first night. Dominic was in the club, but he didn't, he didn't see the thing so much as heard about it. But this guy had seen it. He also was very familiar with the history of Boston comedy, and he knew all the players. Um, and he was able to contextualize it for us in a way that made us realize that we were barking at the right tree. How hard was it, um, I asked both of you and Larry this question, how hard was it to get the, the subjects to agree to do this, to set up the interviews, was it? It, was, it, it varied. I mean, some people were more than happy to do it. Um, some people did it because they thought it was the right thing to do. Other people were more difficult. You know, it's, it's like about a third, a third, and a third, I would say. 
Now, before I get to Larry, I'd like to jump to Stu. Stu, you got involved after the interviews, right? And, and there were uh, 4,000 boxes of tapes. <laughs> it was quite... I, Every shape and size. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but I mean, it, that's, that's what you start doing. You start, I mean, what was attracted to me is I had uh, John's two... Spe- it's actually really great to see John back on stage, yeah. by the way. It's yeah. just really interesting. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, you... On one level, you know, we all want to do this to, you know, introduce John to a new generation, keep his memory alive, uh, support the legacy of John. But on, on the other hand, it, it is a really interesting look at, at stand-up comedy. And stand-up comedy is, I mean, it literally is the most difficult profession in the world. I mean, short of, I mean, yes, there's neurosurgery, but the notion of having to go into these rooms with strangers, you know, with their hands crossed saying, entertain me, and having to be completely nude, you know, not being able to hide behind a character, um, is, is intensely difficult. And as Jim Gaffigan says very appropriately, if you do get that adulation, and then you have to go off stage to the hotel room, to the Marriott in Kansas City, it's, it's a very, very, very difficult life. And I think that John, uh, succumbed to that, and I think he was part of that. And I think it was it was interesting for me because having you know dealt with so many comedians, uh, his story, while incredibly special, is there's a lot of John Panettes out there. You know, the, the interesting thing about comedy, I think, Larry, right, is that comedians tell jokes. Brilliant comedians deliver jokes with a very specific point of view. And John had that point of view. And often those points of views come from a very, you know, genius and, uh, and it's on the head, you know, genius and crazy, genius and dysfunctionality is on the head of a pin, right? And that point of view often comes from a very dark place. And, um, and the genius of John came from a very dark place. Um, Going to Larry, um, your relationship with, with John was very close, but your relationship with these two filmmakers, explain how you worked, how you were sort of worked with Bob and then worked with Stu and then went back and forth. Well, okay. Microphone, sorry. I'm not used to this sort of thing. <laughs> um, <coughs> no, I, I was very fortunate to, to, to work with Stu on the two Comedy Central specials that John did. John also had a first hour that Bob and I worked on together that Bob directed. So John actually had three one-hour specials. I produced all three, Bob directed one, Stu produced two. And so I was very fortunate to have these two guys in my life. I knew the story. I lived the story. That's my life that's up there. And uh, I knew it would be a good story. I knew John was a comedic genius. And I knew John had some terrible... um, personal uh, problems. So my first, as Bob said, we got together and said, well, how are we going to do this? We just started interviewing people. And fortunately, in the beginning, we got Bill Burr, we got Louis Black, we got Dave Cook. And then we started, we said, well, let's go to his high school, see if there's any teachers there that had it. Sure enough, there was his drama teacher and his gym teacher. Really need his biology teacher. <laughs> his gym teacher was awesome. <laughs> and uh, you know, all of a sudden, the pieces started coming into place. And you know, we had a long list of people we wanted to shoot. And there were some people we shot that you know, I wish we could put in this movie right now because they, for one reason or another, you know, we're not, we aren't able to. Um, what, why are you laughing, Stu? I, 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 I'm, there aren't many docs I've seen that has that have both uh, Bill Gates and Howie Mandel in the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, Bob and I sort of came to a point where we said, you know, we've shot you know, 70 hours of interviews now. There's three hours of stand-up, plus all this television and film and wonderful stuff. Let's give Stu a call. <laughs> and that's pretty much what happened. I called Stu on the phone. I, we cut to Bob and I cut together a three-minute or five-minute teaser reel. We went and showed it to Stu, and I think in 45 seconds he said, you know, I mean, you know what the challenge is on this is trying to balance the amount of introducing performance because many people there's a generation that may not even know John at all 
Can I ask you a question? How many people in this room know who John Panette was? Yep. Oh, well, see, okay, or seen him perform, okay. But there was a question of how do you keep, how do you introduce the performance elements and yet drive a narrative story, and in this case, in a chronological fashion, because he physically changes so much during the course of, during the, course of the film. A lot of films you could do in a much more elliptical way, but here you have to go linear because his body shape changes so much. So there's a, there's a lot of lines that, are, that we're working through on this particular film. So. Um, I, I just want to say something publicly. <laughs> I, I can't say enough about these two guys. If it had been left up to me, it would have been a three-hour treatise of loneliness uh, <laughs> that me and five of my friends would have enjoyed. Uh, and so when, we, when, when, when Stu came in and they started cutting, um, Larry correctly banished me to another room, which was very, very smart of him to text me occasionally. Uh, but film, any film, um, and I've, I've been working on film and TV shows for over three decades, it takes a village, and, and everybody has to be good at their job. And these two guys were spectacular. So the initial, I remember we, last week when you talked, so the initial cut that Stu looked at, it was, it was over three hours? Is that no, 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 that would have been my initial cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, were, they were much smarter than I am. How, how did, when did you become happy with what they did? Or, like, when did you see, when did you say, oh, that's the film, or that's, that's this film? Uh, Larry and I spent a couple of days uh, in the edit room putting in things that we thought were important and that we wanted. Uh, and then he and Stu got together uh, and, and then recut it. It was after that cut, I was like, oh, I, I, this, this is watchable. My version would not have been watchable. Uh, it, was, it was that cut that made me go, I, I, I understood what Stu was seeing. Uh, Larry was amazing at being able to balance both sides uh, of it, but it was after that cut that I was like, oh, I, I get this now, I see where this is going. You know, it's, it's an interesting editing process because we're going through John's life and we're going through 25 years of Larry's life. And so it's very, it was interesting watching the cathartic nature of editing this with you because so much of you is on the screen. You were there at so many of these events. Well, well no, I knew where the bodies were buried. Yeah. 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 I knew it. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what, uh, and Bob, you said this, build on this, and you said that you researched the film and you wanted to do it like you did not know who John was. Well, I wanted to do it like I, so I wouldn't have to, I knew Larry knew everything. Right. And I didn't, I didn't, because I was the person asking most of the questions, uh, although Larry came in in, in every interview with things that only he knew, but I didn't want to be entirely reliant on him because I was afraid that it would, kind of make us lazy. So, you know, I watched as many clips and read as much as I could and did as much research as I could so that I had my own body of knowledge so I could ask the questions that, uh, that I wanted to ask and, and then rely on Larry for, for stuff. Like, you know, we would talk to somebody and he'd go, you know, I, that was the weekend in Chicago at Zanies and Larry would go, no, that was in February of this year and it was in Chuckles. <laughs> like, uh, you know, so it, it worked out very. It worked out very well. And Larry, I, I was watching you watch the film, and I, I was actually watching. I Bob disappeared; he was across the aisle. But you two, this is the first time you saw it with an audience. Yeah. What? How? What was that experience like for something you spent? I jump onto something Stu said. I was so moved. I felt like John was here delivering that material. I, I, I was so moved by the audience laughing at his stand-up as if he was here doing his stand-up. I don't know if, if you guys felt that way. Did you, did you feel that way? Yes. Um, to me, I don't know that you could do a documentary on a comedian and get that. And maybe that was just because John was so gracious and so personable. Um, but that, to me, was the thing that I took away that the audience was laughing at 20-year-old material. You know, <laughs> seen and seen again, and seen them a, a third and fourth and fifth time. They were, they were supposed to sit down here, and they, all, they wanted to sit in the back to watch you guys watch the film. And thank you very much for watching it. 
Yeah, and, and I could feel the connection you have with the audience. And some really, really, really. Uh, you can tell that they really like me. Now they've given me a, a five minute. Um, so I, I want to say, so you guys have done this film, and, and it's, a, it's an excellent film. It's a wonderful film. What do you want? What do you want this film to do? Open for it. Well, you know, I, as Bob said, when John, when John passed um, for his memory to be that guy from the final episode of Seinfeld, it's really angry, created a lot of anger. And I think his comedy should live forever. He should go down with all of the greats. And I think if the film can play a part in that, that's what I want. I mean, that's just not our opinion. I mean, yeah, I don't know if you saw how many interviews we did. I cannot tell you the number of comics who said a variation of what Bill Burr said, which is one of the top five live comics who ever lived. Yeah, one of the comedians said that uh, if there was a Mount Rushmore of comedy, John would be on it. And I agree. I think he was a genius. And, and Stu? Oh, it is. It is about preserving the legacy. I mean, that, that really is. You want him to have his, his place because his life was cut short. Yeah. Now, um, I have enough time for a question or two from the audience. Does somebody have a, have a question? Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I guess I guess I'll take that question. <laughs> yeah, the question is he was in such a dark place and seeing him go into that dark place, you know, what, what could be done? Is there anything that can be done? I think at what point in time does anything help or not help? Is that the question? You know, I've been told a lot of times that uh, I was with John for 25 years. I was told a lot of times by his sisters and his family and, his, and, and people he knew all. It's like that if it weren't for me, he would have died 20 years before he did. Um, I don't know that anything ever solves the problem. In fact, I'm pretty sure it, nothing ever solves the problem. I think if you can chip away at it, and we chipped away at it, and we got very lucky in Hairspray, it was a, they said it on the it was a very lucky break. He was sober for, for the better part of three years during that run. If it weren't for that, yeah, and he was brilliant in the show. He was absolutely brilliant. In fact, Jack O'Brien, who was interviewed, the director of Hairspray said he, he was John was his favorite Harvard. Uh, John, Ed, 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 John was his favorite Ed, Ed, including Harvard. That's what we did. But we couldn't use that. We couldn't use that, of course. Uh, uh, can, can I say to that also? It is that Larry and his team, Alex Murray, who you saw, uh, a, a lot of times people like that with these issues uh, are surrounded by people who will say yes and do anything they want. These, these folks did literally everything they could. I happened to be with Larry the day that John passed, and we had the same thought, which was the question wasn't. Why did he die so young? The question was, how did he live so long? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what Larry's saying. Is it, it, it's easy to look at a, a person who's 50 and feel like they're cut down in the middle of their life, and they are. But without these folks, it, it would have been a lot worse. Um, well, they've wrapped me several times. I'd like to say one thing, that, um, something that was cut out from the film. And I asked Larry, why, why did you cut this out from the film? When John received the, the Comedian of the Year Award, first thing he says is, I'd like to thank my best friend, Larry Shapiro. <laughs> and I asked Larry, I said, why did you cut that out of the film? And he said, because I don't want this to be about me. I want it to be about John. And I, I, I thought that would be a good way to, li to leave it. And I think that's how all three that's, that's, that's why I'm not in the film. I chose not to be part of the film on camera. And Bob was too respected that. Uh, request because I didn't want this to be the, the John and Larry film. I wanted it to be about John and his life and his career, his accomplishments, and I think it is. Right. And 